Sky Tyler, welcome to the Brainiac Show. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. I am fantastic today. I am thrilled to have you here. For folks who are not familiar with you and your background and how you came into the Salesforce ecosystem, can you share some insight on who you are and what you are doing in the Salesforce world? Oh, I'd be happy to. I am currently a senior consultant at Exponent Partners, and I work with nonprofits, getting them implemented into Salesforce and Exponent Partners custom uh, Exponent case management. I've been working in the Salesforce space for just about seven years now, and the whole time has been with nonprofits. That's my passion and the, the thing that gets me excited to log in every morning. And I've also been working remotely that entire time. So thankfully in that regard, this pandemic hasn't had that big of an impact on my day-to-day -day work life. But I'm also a huge advocate for the Salesforce military community. I was a prior military spouse whenever I found Salesforce. And I'm just a huge fan of the work that things like Salesforce military and Maravis do to help transitioning soldiers, veterans, and military spouses pivot their career into technology. I'm always impressed by what Salesforce is doing for the military community. For folks who are not familiar with it, can you give a little bit of insight on that? Oh, absolutely. So Salesforce Military, which you may have heard referred to previously as Betforce, it got rebranded a couple of years ago. It's a training community that encourages veterans, active duty military who are in the process of transitioning out of service and military spouses. It provides guided training using Trailhead, of course. It provides certification and then also community support. They've recently, within the past, I'd say, I think year and a half to two years, have been partnering with organizations like Hiring Our Heroes, which facilitates internship programs into the Salesforce space. And they've also developed the Salesforce Military Partner Alliance, which is a collaboration of different companies within the Salesforce space that are committed to hiring veterans and military spouses. Amazing. If folks want to learn more about Salesforce's military-related initiatives, where can they go? They can go to, I believe it's veterans.salesforce.com or salesforce.veterans.com. I can get that to you for sure. We'll, I'll I'm, I'm, no, make sure we'll put a uh, hyperlink in the show notes. Great. So if you are a transitioning military member, a veteran or a military spouse, you can reach out to become a member of the Salesforce military community. If you also want to just support the military community, but you are not yourself a veteran or military spouse, there are ways that you can volunteer to mentor. Also, you can advocate within your organization to increase hiring veterans and military spouses. And there are trailhead modules ready and waiting for you to go out there and learn more. So before we move on to the core topic that we're going to be chatting about, which is really uh, Salesforce career advice, since you do focus a lot on the nonprofit space, there are many people that are in the Salesforce ecosystem that really have no clue. They have no insight whatsoever of how Salesforce can be used at nonprofits. As a consultant myself, I'm also often working with nonprofits, both really small little startup nonprofits, as well as some really large nonprofits. And I always find it so cool to see not only how nonprofits are using Salesforce, but also the additional free features that are available for nonprofits in the nonprofit success pack. And honestly, Many for-profit organizations could benefit from tremendously. So it, it always puzzles me in terms of why are these features only available for nonprofits and not for some for-profit organizations, but that's all other topic. So could you share some insight on how nonprofits are using Salesforce and what this whole nonprofit success pack is even all about? Oh, absolutely. The nonprofit success pack for years was my bread and butter, working with nonprofits, just getting them up and running on it. One of the things that I got really excited about when I first started working with Salesforce is their 111 philanthropy model, where they committed from day one to give back 1% of their profit, their time, and their product. So the nonprofit success pack started off as basically just giving any nonprofit 10 free user licenses to what at the time was just standard Salesforce. And then as more nonprofits started using it, salesforce.org, realized some of these business models don't really work for how nonprofits function. And that's when they really started building out 
uh, NPSP and with amazing things like relationships and affiliations. And as more nonprofits used it, more nonprofit users became active in the community, became active in things like the nonprofit community sprints, which are open source development events that occur. And then going on, Salesforce.org continued to gather information through the idea exchange and just build out bigger, better, and more robust functionality. And of course, uh, a couple of years back, Salesforce.com reintegrated Salesforce.org, which is going to allow even more development capacity for the nonprofit side of the platform. Let's shift over and talk about some career-related advice. What advice would you have for someone who wants to focus their career within the Salesforce ecosystem, but they aren't really sure on where to take it? Oh, that's a great one. The double-edged sword there is there's a lot of different ways to handle your Salesforce career. The downside to that is there's a lot of different ways to handle your Salesforce career, right? So if you're brand new either to technology in general or Salesforce specifically, my first recommendation is take a deep breath and take your time. And this is where you can really be reflective and think more about what do I enjoy doing? If you think about work, you're spending at minimum a third of your life doing it. It should be something you enjoy doing. So thinking about that and a couple of the ways, because I, in a previous career, I was a, a career counselor. And some of the things that I encourage folks to do is to literally just write down what are the things that you enjoy doing. If you had to spend eight hours a day doing data migration, would you be excited about that or would it make you cringe? Do you like talking with people? If you don't like personal interaction, if you'd rather just turn off all the video, shut the door and write code all day, those are important things to know. Another thing that worked really well for a couple of friends of mine was, I don't know how many of you have heard about like the 360 degree assessment. So at organizations, when it's time for your performance review, you have people above you, you have people below you, you have people lateral and everybody gives feedback in a 360 degree view. If you're not at an organization, if you're not currently working, or if you don't want to stay in the industry you're currently in, doing a 360 degree at work might not be useful, but I've encouraged people to do a personal 360, right? So reach out to your friends and family, those folks who know you in and out and ask them for feedback. Sometimes it's hard for us to be reflective if it's not a, a natural process for you, but your friends and family know you. They, they see your actions. They know your values. They know the things that you enjoy doing, the things that frustrate you, sometimes even better than you know them. So ask them, say, hey, if you could wave a magic wand and create the perfect job for me, what do you think that would look like? I think that's great insight. And a lot of people often want to skip over that element of self-reflection because they're just so hungry to get a job and they're so hungry for that income. They're looking, A, for something to occupy their time and B, get compensated for it. So a lot of times people are often just looking for a job, whichever job comes their way. And sometimes it's a job just in a particular industry because they know that they want to be in that industry. You might know that you want to be in the healthcare industry, but if your job involves filing paperwork all day long or just making phone calls, let's say making phone calls to patients, reminding them about their upcoming appointments and the idea of doing that just makes you want to pull your hair out because you would rather be actually working with the patients in a healthcare related fashion. So you're not going to be happy. So to your point, I think it is absolutely critical to think about what it is that you really want to be doing so that you focus your energy on looking for those roles where there's a match. You know what terminology to look for. You know what geographic location you might want to focus on, what type of company you might want to work for. And it's just unfortunate when a lot of people don't take those things into consideration because later on they often find themselves really frustrated with whatever job they took. Oh, absolutely. And then when you add in the challenge of sunk cost, where I went through so much trouble and time and energy to get this job or to learn the skills of this job, it's harder to walk away from that, even if you're unhappy, even if it's not fulfilling. So really taking that time up front. But I do think you make an excellent point that not everybody has the luxury 
to be unemployed for six months while they figure out what their passion is. And this is where another way to be able to handle this is trial and error, yeah. right? So to your point, if you want to be in healthcare and you don't have any prior experience in healthcare, you may have to start out with filing papers or calling patients and it becomes a leapfrog approach. So if you want to get from point A to point F, trying to jump from A to F is a big jump and kind of not likely that you're going to make it all the way to F on the first leap. So what can you do? What is the first step you can take to get from A to B and then from B to C and then C to D? And this also gives you the opportunity to course correct along the way. So you might have thought, like, hey, I want to be a doctor. This is going to be great. And then at step C, you figure out that you faint at the sight of blood probably not going to be a good match for you. Bringing it back to the, the Salesforce analogy, if you've never worked in tech before and you think, I want to be a developer. I see all these posts about developers making these huge salaries and there's so much demand for developers. So it's a good, it's a good career path, but you've never written a line of code in your life, right? Jumping straight in to trying to write Apex triggers, it's going to be real frustrating. Oh, yeah. And you might get part of the way down and be like, actually, I really hate writing code. Like, I just spent five hours trying to debug something and it was like a missing semicolon. Better to find that out early Absolutely. than five years in. A hundred percent. Couldn't agree more. Let's talk about what you think are some of the biggest myths that newcomers to the Salesforce ecosystem should be aware of. I think one of the, one of the myths that frustrates me is that it's going to be easy. And there's a lot of positive hype. Now, first of all, I will say there are a lot of job openings in the Salesforce space, but you also have to recognize that there's a lot of people applying for them. So this myth that, oh, once I get certified, I'm just going to land a job. It's just going to sort of like fall on my doorstep. So that that's the first one. Just let go of that. It's not going to be easy. Anything worth it is going to put, you're going to have to put some work into it. Absolutely. I'm amazed when people reach out to me and they say things like, I completed all of the following trails on Trailhead. I have either one certification or multiple certifications, but I can't find a job. What's going on? Like I thought that one would immediately lead to the next and they are mortified that it's not. And Unfortunately, that's the reality. And the truth is, I often tell people it's the same reality in any industry. Let's look at lifeguards, for example. When someone takes a lifeguarding course and passes an exam or even multiple exams to become a certified lifeguard, that does not mean that automatically jobs are going to land on their lap. Or even when you apply for jobs, it does not necessarily mean that you will be selected compared to the other candidates. Because to your point, there are many other candidates who are applying for these jobs as well. So you need to stand out in some other way. And that yes. could be based on your other skills and talents and your background and your passion and other work-related histories. It could be also non-Salesforce-related work history that you might have. So if you have, let's say, a lot of experience in the financial services industry or the healthcare industry or banking or education or, to your point bef before, nonprofits, and you're applying for a job, even though you're brand new to the Salesforce world, having that industry experience can help you stand apart from the other candidates who are competing against you, really, for the yeah. job. And I think that actually makes a great point of another common myth that I see people perpetuating is that my first job, my first Salesforce job is going to be a senior position or my first Salesforce job, I'm going to land it and it's going to be $85,000 a year. And one of the things I really encourage people to look at is look for the entry level jobs. And again, fully acknowledging that if you've got a family and a mortgage and bills and all of that, it might be hard to take a cut to, to start an entry level job. But the reason I encourage this so strongly is even if you're certified, you went through all the trailhead modules, you got the admin cert, maybe you got platform app builder or something as well. It's a whole different world when you're actually doing the work. And if you want to set yourself up for success and not be fighting imposter syndrome for your first year or two on the job, start entry level. Give yourself that grace of actually 
learning and applying what you've learned and then move up within the space. And I can, yeah. I think everybody has their own path, but I can say when I started, I, even though I had a bachelor's and a master's and over 10 years of other prior work experience, I started an entry level job because I knew I'm not going to stay entry level, right? I'm going to get in there. I'm going to learn it. I'm going to give myself the room to learn it where I'm not coming in and being expected to be an expert on day one. And I went from entry level to a director position in three years, because once you're in and you prove your worth and you're hungry for it and you work for it, there is opportunity for growth and you're going to set yourself up for success better than just trying to jump into that higher level without a good solid foundation. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. And I think there are so many different ways to look at it. Let's just look at it in two different ways. One from the perspective of the employee. Even if I am that employee and I'm so eager, whether it's because I've uh, bought into this myth that I just need to get the certifications to get the job and I should have a job where my business card or my job title says Salesforce admin or senior Salesforce admin because of my age or my prior work experience outside of the Salesforce ecosystem. But even for yourself, you want and need to have that safety net, those training wheels, because if you are that senior Salesforce admin in production for a business, regardless of how small or how large that organization is, as a newbie, everyone makes mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. The question is, how bad of a mistake is it going to be? And how much destruction are you going to unintentionally introduce to the organization. So for your own sake, to minimize your own risk, you want to have some kind of mentor at that job, someone else who knows Salesforce better than you so that you can learn from them. And so we need to put our ego aside for a little bit. And it's just the stepping stone. It doesn't mean that you're stuck, let alone on the flip side of it, which is from the perspective of the employer should, needs to protect themselves. Where just like I often give the example when job candidates often come to me asking, I don't understand, I got the certification. I can't get into a job as a Salesforce admin. If you had elderly relatives coming to visit you and it was time for them to leave and you called an Uber for them and the Uber driver over the top excited saying, oh my God, I am so excited. And you're like, well, what's the deal, kid? <laughs> this is the first time I just got my driver's license today. This is the first time I'm actually behind the wheel of a car. Oh my God. Would you feel comfortable putting your elderly relatives in that car and waving goodbye to them? No, you're going to shoo that kid away and say, go learn somewhere else. I want my loved ones to be protected. The same way for an organization, if Salesforce is being used as their centralized database to keep track of their customers and prospects and deals, that's their bread and butter. That's the most important thing that they have. And the employer needs to protect themselves also by making sure that you're not going unintentionally, again, no one's saying it, it's going to be intentional, unintentionally cause massive destruction to their entire organization. Yes. I'd, I'd like to also add on to that from the employer perspective. So anyone who's listening in, who's responsible for hiring or organizational chart planning, it is critical to have these entry level roles. It's critical to have junior admin roles that are supported by a senior admin. And if you think about it in the terms of like sales pipeline, you need a whole lot of leads that end up getting narrowed down to those few closed one deals. And from a workforce development perspective, the number of jobs and job growth in the Salesforce space is only going to be able to be supported if we have this really wide entry pipeline of entry level and junior positions so that those people can grow and develop into the senior admins and the architects and the developers. I agree. The organizations need to also understand and be prepared for this gradual introduction into the Salesforce ecosystem. 
Yeah. But really quickly, I want to hop back to your one of your previous points about the prior job experience, because as I said, working with a lot of military folks transitioning, it's sometimes hard to market your skills to the civilian world if you were on the Explosive Ordnance Division. We might blow up an org, but it's very different than what our soldiers do. So really being able to translate your prior experience, be able to empathize about what the employers need and what they're looking for, not just what's in the job description, right? Because that's just the surface level. What's the biggest problem that company's facing right now? And then what unique skills or attributes do you have that you can bring to this role? And where a lot of folks get really frustrated is they're like, people don't understand how much value I bring. I'm like, right, they're, that's not their job. It's your job to translate your experience. It's your job to sell yourself and how you are different from the hundred or thousand or 10,000 other people that are applying for that position. Absolutely. Which then ties back to personal branding, which is a recurring theme when it comes to advancing and managing your career, whether it's a Salesforce career or any career really. Oh, absolutely. And the other thing to, to really keep front and center on this, and this is a hard one for folks to grasp because Salesforce is so technical, just about anyone can learn the technical skills, right? There's Trailhead, there's all kinds of other great training programs that are out there to help people learn how to use Salesforce and how to be effective at administering and managing Salesforce. What's a lot harder to learn are the soft skills. And I really wish that like the HR world would come up with a better term than soft skills because they're hard to learn. And if you can figure out how to really wrap your brain around selling your soft skills and get the employers to see the value that you bring from your past experience, anyone can learn the tech side. And, and so you're using a couple different examples of like healthcare and, and lifeguard. And I, personally, I'm a great example of this. My bachelor's degree was in theater. I was a liberal arts theater major. And when I first got out of college, First couple of job interviews I went on, my resume just said bachelor's. I didn't, I didn't put anything else on there. And so in the interview, it would come up. You'd be like, oh, I see you recently graduated with your bachelor's. What's your degree in? And I'd say, oh, it's theater. And there's a kind of awkward pause. And they're like, oh, what can you do with a theater degree? And I very quickly realized that humor is one of my, my assets. And I'd say, I can act like I know what I'm doing until I figure it out. And it was a great icebreaker and it, it showed some humility and the ability to think on the spot. But then I would go into actually my theater degree really taught me project management, resource management, time management, all of those. When you've got a hard and fast deadline, the curtain goes up on Friday at 8 p.m. The show has to be ready. There's a lot of skills that you learn in that. And then from the, the stage side of my training, adapting on the spot, reading an audience, making sure that your message is getting across, being able to maintain calm under pressure. All of those things, I didn't realize it when I was going through my degree, like all of those things were so much more instrumental to my success and my career than learning to write a trigger. Just the communication skills alone, communication on a one-to-one -one level when you're in a meeting with someone, communication skills as a presenter, feeling confident and comfortable and learning how to deliver a message or deliver whatever it is that's in your head, that's on your, uh, in that script to the audience. Those are critical skills that takes a lot of people many years to hone. So I applaud you for seeing the connection and drawing it out and leveraging it, which is great. Yeah. And anybody can do the same thing. Look back at, at previous jobs that you've had and not just what was the like output of that, but what did you have to do successfully to get there? And then how can you take those skills and that experience and translate it into something that the current person you're interviewing with is going to understand and value? Exactly. Love it. Okay. Let me ask you a question about social media. So. I think most of us have seen with the recent growth in social media, it's easy to see how people are having an unrealistic expectation for what they should be getting paid when starting out on their Salesforce career path. 
In addition, those who've been working as a professional from day one say that this has made other people more vulnerable and put pressure on them because there are so many expectations already set even before starting on day one of their job. What are your thoughts on the impact of social media as it relates to people's career expectations in the Salesforce ecosystem? I think that a lot of things, again, I use the term double-edged sword. There is a, there's a success bias in social media. And I'm going to just use an example. Your friend goes on vacation with their family and you look at their posts on all the social media channels and it's the kids are happy splashing in the, the waves, pictures of the beautiful food, the frou-frou drink with the sunset in the background and everything looks like it was a phenomenal trip. And they come home and you say, oh, let's get together and tell me all about your vacation. I can't wait to hear about it. And then you sit down with your friend in person and they're complaining about getting stung by jellyfish and the kids got sunburnt. They were grumpy the rest of the trip and I got food poisoning and my husband and I fought the entire time. That's the reality yep. of what that trip was. But what on the social is just everything is perfect. And the same thing applies in the career space. People tend to only post their successes. They post when they got the job offer. They post when they started the job or they got the promotion, when they passed the certificate. And it sets a very unrealistic and unreal expectation. And again, working with a lot of folks who are getting into the Salesforce space, what it does for them is it makes them feel like they don't belong. If the expectation is you're going to pass your admin cert on the first try and it takes me three tries to pass, then what you start to think is, oh, maybe I don't belong here. Maybe this isn't the right fit for me. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. When the reality is it took that person three or four or five tries exactly. to, to pass it. When people only post, oh, I'm interviewing, but they don't say I went through 50 interviews before I got this job offer. Then to your point before, people are reaching out and they're like, I don't understand, David. How come I, I've got the certificates and I've got this? Why am I not getting hired? I see all these other people getting hired. And so it, it just causes, I think, a lot of unnecessary suffering when, first of all, when you consume this and you think this is reality and I'm not living up to the expectation, but then when you contribute to it as well. And so I always encourage, when I work with folks who are, are in training programs to get their first certification, I encourage them to celebrate every failure, post it on social media, post it on LinkedIn or whichever channel you're on and say like, hey, took my first attempt at the admin cert. I failed, but now I've got my breakdown of where I need to focus and I'm going to get back into this saddle. I'm going to I'm going to pass it next month. And anytime you see someone celebrate one of those failures, congratulate them and make that the norm, make that the expectation that I'm going to fail. Because I remember Dreamforce 2017 was my first Dreamforce. I, I won my conference pass. I had no idea how big the Salesforce space was before I showed up there. And I went, one of my first sessions was study tips for passing certification. And the, the presenter said, be prepared to fail because it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And be okay with that. And then not only that, it's a pass-fail exam. So in the end, even those people who passed, nobody knows whether or not they passed by the skin of their teeth or with flying colors. And to your point, nobody necessarily knows that it took them three attempts, 30 attempts, that it took them four years to get to this point. It's funny because when the topic of taking certification exams comes up, I have no hesitation in acknowledging that standardized exams give me unbelievable anxiety, <laughs> over-the-top anxiety. I've taken many standardized exams. I've taken the bar exam. I'm an attorney. And yes, it gave me tremendous anxiety. When I was working at GE, I had to take a Six Sigma certification exams and over-the-top anxiety. So I personally, I get it when people are simply anxious about taking an exam, but at the same time, Yes, they absolutely, I uh, agree with and I applaud your uh, recommendation on celebrating those failures. But at the same time, for those folks who are not comfortable with it, for whatever reason, they're just 
so humiliated, etc. Okay, guess what? You don't have to share it with anyone else. And nobody has to know that it took you 12 times to pass it. But that one time when you finally do, you will be able to celebrate like everybody else. And so what if it takes you a little bit longer? It's okay. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. There's no set time, right? There's no, oh, if you don't, if you don't pass within the first six months, then you're out. It's not three strikes, you're out. And anytime I need to, for my personal anxiety before taking any standardized exam, as I'm studying for that exam, before I actually sit for the exam, I have going over and over in my head, oh my gosh, I still don't know it. Oh my gosh, I'm going to fail. Oh my gosh, I have no idea. How am I ever going? Oh my, how many times am I going to have to take this exam before without ever actually sitting for the exam to take it? That's what's going on in my, so I get it. I am vicariously living through those experiences before even sitting for that exam. And it can be mortifying and it can be a blow to the ego. It does not have to be. The other thing, I really want to highlight this because especially in the, the hiring space, this has gotten flipped on its head. The original intent of the Salesforce certification exams, these were not supposed to be the entry points. And even if you read the exam guides on Trailhead now, it's like, who is the target audience for the Salesforce admin exam? Someone who's been working in a Salesforce role for one to three years. and so. From a hiring perspective, hey, you know what? If you're a hiring manager and you're listening right now, take that admin certification off your requirement for junior entry-level positions, right? Let them get in there. To your point, let them have a mentor. Let them actually learn the practical application and how to do the thing and how to do it right, and then sit for the admin exam. But unfortunately, that's not the world we live in. The world we live in is every Salesforce job has a minimum requirement that you have the Salesforce admin exam. And you have to recognize that if you are a newbie taking this, the expectation is that you've actually been hands-on in a live org. And so just that expectation right there should let you know this is going to be a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. For the newcomer to the Salesforce ecosystem who has passed one or several certification exams, and then they find themselves actually landing that job where they are responsible, whether it's as a junior admin or as a senior admin, solo admin for an organization. They're completely lost because they've never actually worked in a live org where business users are saying, here's the issue that I'm having. Here's the request that I have. And they have no idea what to do with it, how to translate that into a result that will make those business users give a thumbs up and be satisfied and say, yes, that's exactly that solves the problem that we had. And will also be sustainable, maintainable, and as future-proofed as possible, right? Because anybody can say, a user can say, hey, I need a checkbox that says whether or not I sent the contract. And it's, oh, I can, I'm, I know how to build a checkbox. That was part of my admin training. Great. But what then comes is, what do you actually need to use that data for? Oh, the contracts are due annually, so wouldn't a date field be better than a checkbox field? And those are the kinds of things that you're only going to get with hands-on experience. Yep. Couldn't agree more. So let's shift over a little bit and talk about folks who are seasoned in their career path. Let's take someone who is a project manager or a business analyst, or they have some kind of technology-focused career. They might be in IT but they're relatively new to Salesforce. Do you think too late for them to start? And what advice would you have for someone who's considering shifting mid-career into the Salesforce ecosystem? Yeah, I believe it's never too late to make a shift. There's always opportunities to learn and grow and shift or pivot or whatever fancy term you want to use from today's lexicon. But acknowledge that even though you may have X number of years of prior experience in a similar, related, or completely unrelated industry, you're still going to have to sell yourself. And that's, it, it's the same concept, but a different application as the newcomer, right? You're going to need to be able to prove to an organization, to a hiring manager, or a hiring panel, or a seven-step interview process of why you're the best person for this role. And very similar to the newcomer, what in your past, what in your experience, your skills, your background, your life sets you apart to be the most successful candidate for the position that you're applying for? But then also, 
having a narrative of why you're making the shift, right? Because if if you've got all this prior experience, one of the questions that's inevitably going to come up in that interview process is, why do you want to make this change? And you need to have a compelling story, right? Humans are, are storytelling species. And so having that compelling narrative about why you want to make this change so that they understand that you're invested in this. You've got skin in the game. I agree 100%. And to the point that you made earlier, where anyone can learn the technology, I think, similar to what you just said, that when people are coming from a more seasoned career path, but Salesforce is the new element, they're not abandoning their prior career history whatsoever. They are taking it along with them as valuable skills and experiences that they've had that are immensely helpful within the Salesforce career path that they are now evolving into. I don't even see it as like closing one door and opening another. It's an evolution. Yeah, absolutely. And a good hiring team will recognize the importance that the diversity of viewpoints brings. So having someone who's shifting from one career or one industry to another, you bring a fresh new perspective that someone who's been entrenched in that industry for 5, 10, 15, 20 years isn't going to have. You're going to be able to be that person that asks why, like turning into that five-year-old toddler that asks why for every answer you give them. And if the organization doesn't recognize and value that, I would encourage you to ask if that's the right organization for you to pivot to. Yeah. If they don't value what you bring to the table, they should not be benefit from what you bring to the table. Hey, if that ship sailed without you, that wasn't your ship. Okay. So my next question for you is lots of folks in any career path or industry feel stuck in terms of career growth. What advice would you have to give folks who are experiencing this within the Salesforce ecosystem? Oh, wow. Yeah. Getting stuck is not a comfortable place to be. I've been there. I've coached people who are there. And I think, honestly, the first step is just recognizing that you feel stuck. Because I think a lot of times we can have the tendency to turn a blind eye or try to gloss over or make excuses. So really, at the beginning of our conversation, going back to being a little bit reflective, right? What is it about your current situation or scenario that makes you feel stuck so that you can then identify what it's going to take to unstick you? And the great thing is there are so many opportunities in the Salesforce space. There are so many ways to carve your path. And one of the things I, I really encourage is be okay with changing your mind. If you start off going in one direction, again, if you start off thinking, I'm going to be a developer, and then you realize that you miss talking to humans on a regular basis, then be okay with saying, hey, I got this far down this path, but this isn't the right way to go. And I, I'm... I, Outside of my Salesforce life, I'm an avid hiker, and I've got some friends who just fundamentally refuse to backtrack. They don't ever want to have to walk back down the same trail they just came down. And it's just, oh, we took a wrong turn. And my instinct is, okay, let's go back to the last place that we knew was the right turn and course correct. And they're like, no, no, we'll just, uh, we'll, you know, loop around. Or I've gone on a couple of trips where we end up bushwhacking through thickets and briars and all kinds of stuff because my friend refuses to backtrack. And you just end up causing yourself more anxiety and more frustration. So, yeah, you have to figure out what's wrong with where I'm at and where do I want to be? And then what are the incremental steps I need to get there? Because again, that idea of jumping from A to F in one leap, right? It's hard. Absolutely. And honestly, I would suggest applying the same advice, not only to folks who are stuck, who feel stuck in their Salesforce career, but honestly, I think everyone should do that type of self reevaluation at the very least once a year, if not more frequently. Am I happy with what I am doing? Am I 
what do I want to do next? What I'm over 50. I'm still asking myself, what do I want to be when I grow up? So, and it's okay to, again, going back to the point we talked about a moment ago, think of it as an evolution. You're not like constantly chasing the next shiny object that comes your way. You're building upon the lessons, the experiences that you've had up until that moment to choose what is the next appropriate course of action from here forward. It's just another step in a different direction. And that's okay. Absolutely. When I started working in this, when I was interviewing for my first Salesforce positions, I had made a list of my wish list of what a career path would look like. What kind of traits does the company have? What are the things that I'm doing? What kind of people do I work with? And it was pretty impressive. I made this before I ever started interviewing for Salesforce jobs. And then when I landed my first job and I had my six month review with my supervisor, I took this list back out and I was like, I had like about 20 things on this list of like my perfect job. And that job hit like 17 of them. Oh, wow. And so then when I went to make my next career move, I made a new list because I'm not going to just assume that the same list from three and a half years ago still applies. I've changed. I've grown. So I made a new list and I used that as my evaluation criteria when I was interviewing for next companies. And I think it's a powerful tool to do personally, but once you're in a position, it's a really useful tool to do with your manager, right? Because if you think about it, there's a lot of cost of switching jobs, right? There's the time and energy of the job hunt, the application, the interviews, and then you come into a new company. Now you have to learn the new culture and you have to learn all of the nuance of it. And it's time intensive and it can be stressful. So if you're in an organization that you're for the most part happy with, but you're feeling stuck, have this conversation with your supervisor and say, these are the things about my current job that I love and I, I don't want to change, but these are the things that are challenging for me and just aren't working. What can we do collaboratively, you and me and the rest of the company, to help me be the highest contributing member that I can be. Definitely. And I think even if the response to that is not in the way that we would hope it would go. So let's make believe for a minute, worst case scenario, I'm the employee, I'm having that conversation with my manager and my manager sort of cringes. And in some way, I'm getting the sense that my manager's goal is to keep me in the same exact job, doing the exact same thing for eternity. I think it's still insanely valuable to have that discussion with the manager because whether the manager is clearly articulating it or you're simply getting that vibe from what the manager is not saying it's important for you to know that and yeah. you're probably saving yourself months if not years of hoping wishing that something will change when it's not going to change so at least you have that level of awareness so that you can make the appropriate decisions on do i want to stay here and keep doing this or is it time for me to start looking for another job? Like, no, my seat is not on fire, but there is limited room for career growth here. So might as well look for something else. Yes. And I'm going to, for just a moment, I'm going to speak to the women in the audience because study and research have shown that women are notoriously bad about doing this, where we think if I just do my work and I do it well, people are going to recognize it and I'll get rewarded for it. And some organizations are actually exceptional at doing that, but most organizations reward people who ask for it. And if your manager doesn't know what you want or what you need to be the highest performing person that you can be there, and if you don't ask for it, there's a really good chance you're not going to get it. And you're going to just keep doing the same thing, whether you enjoy it or not. And so if you don't lead that charge, if you don't take control of that conversation, it's unlikely to happen. And it's even more unlikely that the things that you want are going to just fall into your lap. So as uncomfortable as it is, as contrary to your personal nature as it may be, it is in your best interest to practice speaking up for what you want or need to be successful. Agreed. It's so important. And by the way, that was me for many years in my career path at some incredibly large corporations where 
I felt that if I put in the hard work and I'm successful, then everything will come. And it simply did not. And I was terribly disappointed. Last question. So people often talk about the Salesforce community as this vague thing. How can Salesforce professionals leverage the Salesforce community to advance their careers? Like where should they turn to? What is it that they can actually do within the Salesforce community to advance their careers? Oh my gosh. The Salesforce community honestly is one of the things I love the most about the whole Salesforce thing. And I think that Salesforce and the community have done just a phenomenal job of building this network. So my perspective, the Salesforce community is a large, interconnected, ready, out of the box to use network, right? So if you're the kind of person who you don't like making cold introductions, if you go to the social events and you wait for people to come up to you, then Salesforce community has a really low entry point. And so logging into the Trailhead community to get into the Trailblazer community, there's user groups, community user groups, and they can be location-based or industry-based or group personality, persona-based, but it's like-minded people with a passion for Salesforce who also care about other people. And so one of the ways that I really encourage newcomers to the space to leverage the community is in the Trailblazer community when people are able to post questions about problems or challenges that they're having. A few of the benefits of a newcomer interacting with this is, one, you get to see real world scenarios, right? So a lot of the things in the Trailhead modules are real world-ish, but they walk you through prescribed steps for a solution. And that doesn't often happen in the real world. So getting into the Trailblazer community and seeing the challenges that people are having and then seeing the suggestions that other people have on how to resolve that helps you to start to develop that critical thinking capacity about how to work on the Salesforce platform. By asking additional probing questions, it's again helping to build that thought process and resolution process for yourself. And then thirdly, it's connecting you with other people. So you start to get to know people, even in a very virtual way. And a recent book I was reading, Adam Grant's Give and Take, was talking about networking. And there was this outstanding statistic. I'm not going to quote the number because I'll get it wrong. But this idea that the number of jobs that people land based on like small connections, right? So a big connection is or a strong connection is someone that you've worked directly with. Right. So a, a previous coworker, current coworker, and then a sort of weaker connection would be someone that you know through the Trailblazer community, someone you've, you know, had a conversation with on a thread of, hey, how do I solve this thing with customizable rollups for my nonprofit? That becomes a weak connection, but more job matches are made through weak connections than through strong ones. And so starting to build more of those weak connections. You don't have to invest 15 hours a week on LinkedIn and Trailblazer community and community groups and all of that. Just set up a plan, right? And say, okay, on Monday, I'm going to, you know, comment on two posts on LinkedIn. On Tuesday, I'm going to comment on two questions on the Trailblazer community. On Wednesday, I'm going to retweet and comment on three Salesforce related tweets. That's it. You do that every week for a couple of weeks. Now you start to get your own followers. You start to figure out who you're going to follow because they have similar interests or they're in the industry that you want to be in. And then if you have the capacity, either with local in-person events that are now starting to open back up or online virtual events, going to some of these Trailblazer community events. It's a great opportunity in person. You get to have other people presenting something that they're an expert on or that they have experience on. You get to ask questions in real time and you get to make more of those connections. And I can say for myself, again, referring back to Dreamforce 2017, when I showed up, I think that year there was like 130,000 people at Dreamforce. I knew five, like literally I knew five people at Dreamforce 2017. And it was completely overwhelming because I literally didn't know anyone. I I knew just the few people that I had either were working directly with or were briefly connected with through the Salesforce military community. And fast forward to 
this past Dreamforce 2021, obviously much smaller event. But I estimated that I knew like by name and felt comfortable walking up and saying, hey, how are you doing? More than half of the people there just through these small, short interactions. And I've I found additional I've moved up my career by people that I'd networked with and I've helped and worked with, I can't even count how many folks that had reached out to me, you know, like, hey, do you have 15 minutes to talk or tell me more about nonprofits on Salesforce and have been able to say, hey, you should also connect with and let me make a, let me make an introduction. Let me hand you off to this other person. And it's that web of connection. And then when you have a problem and you get on Twitter and you do ask Salesforce and then 15 people pop in with, hey, how about this? Or send you a DM and you want to get on a video chat real quick and we can try to work through this. And to your point earlier about like those junior admins, having a mentor, having someone who knows what they're doing and can help you and support you, even if you can't have that at your actual job, you have that in the Trailblazer community. A hundred percent. Yeah. And then the flip side, and this is the part that makes people real uncomfortable. So buckle up. No matter how new you are, you have something valuable to contribute to the community. It is not just about what can I take from this? What can I get from it? How can it help me? You have that wealth of previous experience that we've mentioned several times already. That's right. You have your own personal perspective. You have your own personality, your own, you know, brand background. You have something to contribute. And I would encourage you, even if it's uncomfortable, especially if it's uncomfortable, reach out to your community user group and say, hey, can I present on something? Can I give a 15-minute presentation on this thing that I just learned? I agree 100%. And it goes directly back to Adam Grant's book, Give and Take. And I'm glad that you brought it up because it's one of my favorite books. I've actually read it several times. You might think just by reading the title, okay, I get the essence of the book. And you don't. Because oh. within the book, he explains these fundamental concepts that go to just core societal norms and behavioral, psych psychological and behavioral uh, responses that we get from people and how we respond to certain situations where... By your, you putting yourself out there and helping others first with zero expectation of getting anything back in return and giving wholeheartedly, you will reap the rewards in exponentially higher amounts than whatever you contributed. And people might read the book and initially think there's no way please he's talking like a college professor speaking from experience it absolutely works and this ties in directly back with everything that you talked about regarding contributing into the community and being involved in the salesforce community and what you get back from the community which it, it really produces magical results for people to your point it benefits you intrinsically to help and support and champion others. And that's why I encourage, I have a lot of folks that I've talked with that say, oh, I can't wait to learn more so that I can give back. And I say, don't wait to give back. You've got something now. You've got something unique that nobody else in the Salesforce space has. Don't hold back on that. Important lessons to help anyone really take their career in a whole other direction or to a whole new level. Amazing. Sky, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. The listeners are sure to love this interview and you are an inspiration to me as well. Oh, just thank you all so much. Just by even listening to this podcast, you're already contributing to the Salesforce community. And uh, we look forward to connecting with you and maybe seeing you at Dreamforce someday. Awesome. Thanks again, Sky. Thank you.